Yes, basketball has changed. It's always been a great game, but now it has a new spirit. He dunks like Dr. J. He might be the new Iceman. The modern day, Will Chamberlain. He looked like Magic Johnson. The future has arrived. You are watching what greatness is all about. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Vintage NBA. I'm Charlie Steiner, coming in off the bench this week in place of Robin Roberts. Now, today we're going to profile a player who forever changed the game of basketball, Elgin Baylor. It was Baylor who literally helped the game get off the ground during his 14 stellar seasons with the Lakers. Now, after his playing days, Elgin returned to L.A. as general manager of the Clippers. And in 1999, he drafted a young man who's become the cornerstone of the franchise, Lamar Odom. And this week, Lamar's in the chair talking about his boss, Elgin Baylor. The game was played like this until Elgin came and gave us this. The flavor of the game. The flavor of the game belongs to Elgin Baylor. Elgin just brought a flair to the game that um, a lot of players are, are not able to duplicate to this day. I first learned of his legacy when I got to the league. I've seen some footage on him. I was amazed at what I was seeing. Elgin was the first athletic basketball player. You know, in the 50s and the early 60s, there wasn't a player who, who, who played like Elgin. And speaking of all-around stars, here he is, perhaps the most complete player the game has ever seen. The Lakers' captain, an all-pro every year since he's been in the league, Elgin Baylor. When you make a move that that takes a tremendous amount of body control and you get the ooze and ah from the crowd, you know, that's definitely going to feel good because not only are you a basketball player, you're also an entertainer. I'd like to show you some of the patented moves and some of the ad-lib moves of Baylor. He's got them all. It's no wonder they were so popular with the fans. Where would the game be today if, you know, if Elgin didn't bring the spin moves and the behind-the-back passes? We'll probably still be playing the, the real fundamental bob and weave, pick and roll type of game. He's around Jack and scores. What a brilliant play. Players like Elgin, you got to take a little bit from his game and kind of incorporate into your game. We are seeing a star born right here tonight. His name is Lamar Odom. He's real confident in his ability. He even thinks he could play in the game today and dominate. <laughs> I don't think my teammates really realize, you know, what he did for the game because we're, we're all so young. Hopefully one day Elgin can sit us down and play his grandpa role and just sit us to the side and really let those young guys know what he, what he did. Now obviously Lamar is much too young to have seen Elgin play. His childhood heroes were Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. But now he and Baylor have joined forces to try and make the Clippers a winner and maybe even eclipse their crosstown rivals, the Lakers. The glamour team in L.A. thanks in large part to Elgin himself. And we're going to take a look back at his Hall of Fame career in just a moment. This is the magnet that draws the fans into the new Los Angeles sports arena, now that big league professional basketball has reached the West Coast. Elgin Baylor, regarded by many as the best basketeer in the world. If you're a competitor, you, know, you like the idea of competing, but uh, going out with the feeling, knowing that, feeling, anyway, feeling that way, that one-on-one -on -one, nobody's going to stop you from scoring. <laughs> The first time I saw him play, uh, I marveled. He used a lot of uh, body English, body language, and he put a lot of spin on the ball from both sides of the basket. There's Elgin going all the way. So he did a lot of things uh, with the ball that seemed like fun, a fun way to play the game. So where did Elgin Baylor come up with his first name, Elgin? 
Well, as it turns out, it was his father's favorite pocket watch. It's called an Elgin. It may have been an omen, because in many ways, Elgin Baylor was way ahead of his time. He was one of the first of the NBA's truly flashy performers. He made spectacular plays long before they became a staple of nightly highlight reels. And when Baylor arrived in the NBA, no one had ever seen a player quite like him. He had what we call a hang time. He used to, he looked like he stayed there forever. Elgin was the first one to, you know, go up for the jump shot and hang up there for 15 seconds, have some, some lunch and a cup of coffee, and, you know, the defenders would all be back on the ground, and he'd finally decide to shoot the thing. Elgin Baylor was Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. Baylor would, would just blow your socks off. You'd never seen anything like that before. Elgin Baylor arrived in the NBA in 1958 as the top draft choice of the Minneapolis Lakers. With his unprecedented blend of power and aerial artistry, he immediately took the league by storm. He was strong, he could drive past you. He hit the outside, shot pretty good. He was an outstanding passer. He was the type of a guy that if you had to play him, you said, let me let me off him. <laughs> okay. Another thing he had, uh, he had like a little tick, a little, a little uh, twitch, and that would kind of throw you off because you're on him, and they'd be twitching, and he, you'd, you'd kind of get a little nervous. Leaving defenders grasping for air, Elgin set a single-game NBA scoring record when he scored 71 points against the Knicks, and he quickly transformed them into perennial title contenders. This is the magnet that draws the fans into the new Los Angeles sports arena, now that big league professional basketball has reached the West Coast. Elgin Baylor, regarded by many as the best basketeer in the world. If you're a competitor, you know, you like the idea of competing, but uh, going on with the feeling, knowing that, feeling, anyway, feeling that way, that one-on-one -on -one, nobody's going to stop you from scoring. And he was never more unstoppable than in the 1962 Finals when Baylor scored a finals record 61 points in Game 5 against Boston. Up and over the greatest defensive player in the game, Bill Russell, a dunk shot. And I remember going after the game over to Tom Sanders, whose uh, responsibility had been inside of God Elgin, and saying, Satch, I think you did a hell of a defensive job tonight. You know, I mean, he, Elgin was that spectacular where he literally be became the first guy that couldn't be stopped. That season, Elgin and the Lakers took the Celtics to a decisive seventh game, and with the game tied, L.A. would have a chance to win the title with one final shot. With only three seconds left. Los Angeles has one last crack at the hoop. Selby misses the jump shot, and we go into a five-minute overtime with a score knotted 100 to 100. Boy, and that one shot, if that would have gone in, uh, it might have changed the course of history a little bit. But history was cruel to the Lakers, as they would lose not only that series, but five more times to the Celtics over the next seven years, each defeat more painful than the last. We just did not have anyone uh, to negate Bill Russell. It was just simple as that. Uh, and we could match him in other positions, but we just could not match him in the middle position. But with the addition of Wilt Chamberlain, the Lakers were heavily favored to win the 1969 Finals over an aging Celtics dynasty. And it seemed as if the 35-year-old Baylor would finally win a title. But in the seventh game, the series would be decided by an incredible twist of fate. Erickson, knocked away, but Nelson gets it. And the Boston Celtics have done it again. That's probably was the toughest one because we all felt that we had the best team. As they say, the luck of the Irish, yeah. they won. And I think that was the toughest loss. I think that affected uh, the players that had been there all the years more than anyone. In 1972, the Lakers finally won their first championship in Los Angeles. But they had done it without Elgin Baylor. Age and injuries forced him to retire just nine games into that season. He left the game without that one prize that he had sought for so long. 
And, and I think the saddest thing about Elgin was that, no, he never won a championship. Came so close so many times. Despite his playoff frustration, Elgin Baylor still left an enduring legacy. He revolutionized the game and set the stage for the high-flying style of today's NBA. When you leave, you hope that you've left something, something that you will be remembered for. There were a lot of comparisons with Elgin Baylor, who I saw play many times on, on TV, and uh, patterned a lot of my um, uh, body movement uh, after. Modern basketball began with Elgin Baylor. When I say modern basketball, every single reverse layup, every single between the legs dribble, every single spinning move that you see in a routine manner in every single NBA game owes its existence to the mind of one man, Elgin Baylor. You know, Elgin might have won a string of scoring titles had it not been for the presence of one Will Chamberlain. For instance, Baylor averaged 38 points per game in 1962. That happened to be the year that Wilt averaged 50 while playing in Philadelphia. When Baylor retired, he was third on the all-time scoring list. He tried his hand at coaching for a time and then moved into the front office with the Clippers. We'll take a look at some other stars turned executives right after we take you back to Baylor's rookie season, 1959. At the 2000 NBA Draft, no team was busier than the Los Angeles Clippers. Now, as we log on to NBA.com, we'll see that L.A. had three picks in the first round and acquired two others in a trade with Orlando. It was all the work of team vice president Elgin Baylor. Now, he's one of a number of players who went from making the shots to calling them in the front office. For instance, Elgin's former teammate, Jerry West, remained with the Lakers as GM once his playing days were done. He built the Showtime dynasty that won five NBA titles in the 80s and then built another championship team around Shaq and Kobe in 2000. Nick Ray Dave DeBusher also became an executive. As commissioner of the old ABA, he helped the league merge with the NBA in 1976. And as vice president of the Knicks, he single-handedly won the 1985 draft lottery that featured Patrick Ewing as the top prize. And these days, Michael Jordan is putting his leadership skills to the test as president of the Wizards. Michael's always loved to challenge, and that certainly is what he's got on his hands in Washington as he tries to build the Wizards into a winning team. Of course, there are other examples of stars who have found new careers as executives. Some stayed in their chosen fields, while others decided to try something a little bit different. For instance, General Dwight D. Eisenhower led American forces to victory in World War II. He was so popular that both parties tried to enlist him to run for president. He ran as a Republican in 1952 and was promptly elected to two terms. Politics always seemed to be in Bill Bradley's future, a Princeton graduate and a Rhodes Scholar. He was nicknamed Mr. President by his Nick teammates. Bradley, of course, hasn't gotten that far, at least not yet, but he did serve three terms as senator from New Jersey. Ron Howard gained fame as an actor playing Opie on The Andy Griffith Show and Richie Cunningham on Happy Days. But Ron then made the move to the other side of the camera as a director and has directed hit movies like Splash, Cocoon, and Apollo 13. As a member of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson ushered in the surfing sound of the 60s. For a while, he rode the wave of hits, but then he stopped touring with the group. Wilson turned his talents to writing and producing. And in 1966, he produced the seminal album, Pet Sounds. And while Southern Californians were listening to the Beach Boys, local basketball fans were watching Elgin Baylor and the Lakers. The team moved into a new building in 1967, the Fabulous Forum. And with a look at some of the other modern arenas around the NBA, correspondent Chris Schenkel. The NBA plays in the best arenas throughout the country. This includes such places as Madison Square Garden, Detroit's Kobo Arena, Baltimore's Civic Center, the Cincinnati Gardens, 
The Boston Garden. The Los Angeles Sports Arena and many others. The games attract growing numbers of fans from ocean to ocean. And you'll find many famous personalities in the crowds, ranging from TV star David Jansen and his wife. Doris Day. And Governor John Volpe of Massachusetts. From Boston to Baltimore, from New York to San Francisco, pro basketball gets a hand and a holler. So from the looks of it, the NBA really has a chance to catch on. And all the celebrities, even Doris Day, were on hand for the 1966 finals. It was the Lakers against the Celtics. And you'll see it in the Airwave archive when we come back. During Elgin Baylor's career, the Lakers made eight trips to the NBA Finals. Problem was, it kept running into the Celtics. Boston was the one mountain L.A. never could seem to climb. In 1966, the two rivals met once again. Boston led three games to one and looked to wrap it up in Game 5, which brings us to this week's Airwave Archive. In glorious black and white, here's Chris Schenkel and Bob Cousy at Boston Garden with L.A. trying to hang on in the final seconds. Have a two-point lead. Chris, don't think it doesn't take a little uh, intestinal fortitude on the part of uh, two officials who have done a tremendous job today to call a foul like that in front of 13909 partisan fans. This entire series, incidentally, has been handled extremely well by these officials. There's been a minimum of complaining on uh, the part of either the Lakers or the Celtics which normally is an indication that a good job is being done if you don't know the uh, officials are working. And Jerry West, who scored the field goal and put the Lakers back in the lead, is at the foul line. He is 9 for 9 from the foul line, and Casey Jones, who just came in the lineup, has called for a timeout. And on the clock, it appears, Bob, that we have about 10 seconds left in this ball game, with the Lakers leading by 4, 119 to 115. 119 to 117. Only two, three, or four seconds remaining in the ball game. The Lakers leading by two points as a dejected red R back. And it appears, uh, Bob, pretty much that he's going to have to wait to light a victory cigar at least till Tuesday and maybe back here again in Boston. Exactly, uh, Chris. I'm sure at this point he's much more concerned about ever lighting that victory cigar. In other words, uh, the Lakers have once again displayed what a fighting team they are coming from behind twice in this game. And now it looks like they definitely will go back Tuesday. And if they can tie it up, why, anything can happen in one ball game. So I'm certain that Arnold is much more concerned about uh, winning the World Championship than he is about where uh, he'd like to win it. At one time, these Lakers, who deserve the utmost in credit, led by 17 points. They saw that lead go. And with the Celtics by eight, they have come back, as Bob has told you, and here are the reserves. We're looking at Gene Wiley. Some of the others on the bench, Bob Boozer. They've been watching great interest out here. As we now have Lu Rudy LaRusso at the foul line. And he puts the Lakers in front by three points. Only seconds remaining in this ball game. Weston LaRusso in the last seconds of the game. And there is the gun. And Earl Strom, it was not the gun. There is time still remaining as the Boston Celtics have taken time out, but the Los Angeles Lakers lead by four points, as you see. There's actually a fraction of a second left, Chris. And of course, with our one of our clocks indicating the 24 second or enforcing the 24 second rule being not a operative and using the stopwatch. 
We have no other indication other than the regular clock, which overhangs and also is in the front of the lower facade here at Boston Garden. We hope you've enjoyed this ball game. It's been a thriller here at courtside. 121 to 117. Only seconds remaining as the Lakers have shown the great team effort here this afternoon, coached by Freddie Schaus. You know, as Red Auerbach has indicated, doesn't have stars, just a great team unit. And of course, the Lakers have a victory. And that makes it three to two in the best of seven series. It's a great win for Los Angeles. Once again, the final score, Los Angeles 121, Boston 117. Now that game may have been in black and white, but we did want to show you what Elgin's jersey actually looked like. We have this replica of the old Lakers blue and white jerseys from the early 60s. They gave way to the late 60s familiar purple and gold uniforms. By the way, the Lakers did win game six of the 66 finals, but they lost game seven. As we head to a break, something else for you to ponder about the year 1966. The NBA All-Star Games of the 60s had at least one thing in common. Every one of them featured Elgin Baylor. Elgin was an 11-time All-Star. And right now, we're going to look back at one of his final appearances from 1969 in Baltimore. The announcer for the game, Chris Schenkel, making yet another appearance along with his partner, Jack Twyman. And it's all in living color in this installment of the Airwave Archive. Back again at Civic Center in the NBA All-Star Game. The East leading by seven points, 60 to 53, as we await the start of the second half, and it should be a thriller. In that first half, Oscar Robertson and Earl Monroe were the leading scorers with 10 points each for the East. And there you see the statistics. Lucas and Cunningham with eight. Moving on down, the entire roster of 12 All-Stars representing the Eastern Division of the NBA. While for the Western All-Stars, Len Wilkins with eight, and several men with six, as you see, going on down the line. Twice, the West trailed by only six points. But as we start the second half, it is 60 to 53, and in the center circle, a scene that we have uh, seen so often now being duplicated on the right, Will Chamberlain, and on the left, Bill Russell. Two phenomenal basketball players.